Okay, well, welcome back. This is lecture eight. So we are continuing with positive definite matrices. So last time, so we say that A matrices, positive definite or positive semi-definite, whatever the case is. So here is an if and only if statement. X transpose A, X, is greater than or equal to zero. Well, this is optional. In other words, it can be greater than zero or greater than or equal to zero. This should be for all x not equal to zero vector. Okay. So I have a positive quantity over here. This is a scalar. This is a positive quantity. Or if I have an equality, this becomes a non-zero quantity. Then this A matrix is called positive if this is the case, positive definite. If I have equality case, also positive semi-definite. Now here's a question. So over here I'm assuming A matrix is symmetric. Okay, A matrix is symmetric over here. So what happens when A is not symmetric? This is just a note. Well, note that it's a question mark. Note that a is equal to a plus a transpose divided by two plus a minus a transpose divided by two. So this, these are matrices. Okay. So clearly, this is the symmetric part, and this is the anti-symmetric part. So I can say that this matrix is a symmetric part, and this matrix is a anti-symmetric part. Okay. Now, if I multiply, let me try to apply this definition. X transpose a x, but every a can be decomposed as symmetric plus non-symmetric is equal to x transpose a symmetric plus anti-symmetric. But let me operate by x. x. Okay? So I have this equality that you see also over here. Now here is the case. Now if I have an anti-symmetric matrix, now this is a scalar. If I take the transpose of this scalar, x transpose a antisymmetric x transpose, this is, since it's a scalar, it is equal to the original scalar without the transpose. Because it's just a number, something like 1, 5, etc. So if I evaluate this transpose, x transpose, a transpose antisymmetric x, so it's equal to this. But let's pay attention, this is equal to this is antisymmetric matrix transpose. If you take the transpose of this matrix, you are taking the transpose of this bracket. Then I see this antisymmetric matrix transpose is equal to minus A antisymmetric. Okay, because if I take the transpose of this, I have T over here, this T cancels, so I get minus one times this parenthesis. Okay, then what do I see? Now I see that this part is equal to, then, from these two, then let me call this left hand side, let me call this right hand side, then this left hand side is equal to minus, because there's a minus over here, x transpose a antisymmetric x. So this is the left hand side. Because after taking this transpose, I end up with a minus sign without transpose over there. Okay. So this is equal to x transpose. So 
So this is right hand side, the same thing. So what do I have? If I move this over here, so I see the following, X transpose, antisymmetric matrix, X is equal to just zero. Because this is a scalar, move the scalar on the other side. Now I have zero scalar over here. Two times of this scalar is equal to zero. So this scalar, this is equal to zero. So what do I see? Then this is always equal to zero. I don't need to worry about this. So only the symmetric part is important. If you are considering this quadratic form, only the symmetric part of A is important. So this is our conclusion. So for the sake of quadratic form, x transpose ax only a symmetric which is a a transpose divided by 2 is the matrix important for the calculation let's say so in other words, if you do not have a symmetric matrix at the beginning, calculate the symmetric part and then insert it over here and work with the symmetric part. Because anti-symmetric part does not bring any, it brings a zero to the right hand side. Okay, this is my final message about this positive definite matrices and so on. So let me erase this part. So let me write you know, the following. Overdetermined equation systems. So we will apply our results right now over here. So let's assume I have N equations with K unknowns. Okay, and n is greater than k. Okay, so we are at this. So this case is very practical for signal processing. Let's see. So I have such a matrix. So I have x1, x2, x capital K. Sorry. So this is a you know first row. Let me say first equation. So this is the last equation and equation. So I have such a equation system. B1, B2, Bn. So let me call this A11, A12, some numbers, A1k. A21, A22, A2K, AN1, ANK. Okay. Okay. So I have an equation system. So we call this equation system as follows. So this is called a tall matrix because it's like a tall matrix. Okay, so A is a tall matrix, meaning that it has more rows, as you see, than its columns. So transpose of this will be something like this, okay? So this is wider. So sometimes this is called fat or short matrix, fat, well, I don't remember the detail, fat slash short matrix, okay? So this is the other way, fat and short matrix if you have a matrix like this, but it's a tall matrix. A tall matrix times x is equal to b, okay? Now again, we can discuss whether this system has a solution or not and so on. Range space arguments, we can check whether, you know, these columns are independent and so on. But let's do the following this time. 
let's define an optimization problem. Jx s ax minus b norm square is our cost function. Okay. So in other words, I have this right hand side. So this is my A matrix. This is my x vector. This is my b vector. So this is left hand side, ax, minus right hand side. Okay. So this is the error vector, you may say. Left minus right. Error vector, norm square is minimized. Okay. So of course this is, you know, for the sake of this calculation, this is our norm, z transpose z, which is Euclidean norm. Okay, conventional Euclidean norm. So what do I do? Now, let me do this then. Ax minus b transpose Ax minus b. Okay. So this is equal to x transpose a transpose minus b transpose. Okay, this part. Okay, then let me operate with this. x transpose a transpose times this ax minus x transpose a transpose times b this times this b transpose ax plus b transpose b. Okay. So this is my cost function. Jx. Now, let me take transpose of this because it's a scalar, as I have said, maybe just a few minutes ago. If I take its transpose, this is also equal to b transpose a x if I take this. Well, you see that this is equal to this. Okay? Because it's a scalar, I can take its transpose, I get the same quantity. So this thing is also equal to B transpose A X. Okay. So one more time. X transpose A transpose A X minus two B transpose. AX plus B transpose B. But maybe it's better to write the other way around. So, okay, one more time. Instead of this, I can also write X transpose, transpose of this, A transpose B. If I wish, I can write also this for this one. Okay, X transpose A transpose B. Now, if I take the gradient of J, J, with respect to X, and equate it to zero, zero vector, what do I get? So I get an, let's say, maxima or minima of this problem, if I can evaluate this gradient and equate it to zero. Okay. So let's try to do that, gradient calculation. Okay, so what's the gradient of this term? We have studied this. Well, remember, gradient of x vector, x transpose a x is a plus a transpose x. Okay, this is what we have done before. Similarly, gradient of b transpose x is equal to b. Okay, so I will apply those results. Okay, so then gradient of x of j of x. This is a vector. This is a vector. My gradient vector. Okay, so first one. So this is already symmetric. So I get, you know, I would like to use this result. But since this matrix M is equal to M transpose, I get 2M times x. So I get 2 a transpose a times x. How about this one? So I have minus 2. Well, let me, so I get this, as you see, this vector. a transpose b. Because if I take the gradient with respect to x, 
whatever this vector is, elements of this vector is scaling this x vector. So I'm writing that vector over here. How about the gradient of this? This is not a function of x, it's equal to zero. So there is nothing to add, so I have this. So what do I have? I have this equation system. A transpose AX is equal to A transpose B equation system. So I can cancel these twos. Okay. Now, one more step. So if, please remember what was this called? This is called the Gramian matrix. If this matrix is invertible, as we have said before, meaning that if its columns are independent, so this it has k columns. If its columns are independent, which is the case in many problems, then x, this is called the least square solution, is equal to a transpose a inverse a transpose b. Okay? Actually, we have done this before. This is our projection result. And if I insert, for example, over here, a x least square, so this is a times this, a transpose a inverse, a transpose b. In other words, this becomes our projection matrix, as before. So the least square solution, the solution of this problem, is equal to, of course, our earlier result of, you know, projecting a given vector b to the frame space of this A matrix. Well, this is the same problem. So what is different? Previously, we were solving this problem. Remember that previously, we were solving this problem using some geometric arguments, like angles, so on. So at this point, we have developed some mathematical machinery, as you see, on solving quadratics with multiple variables. So applying this mathematical machinery, basically, this gradient results. Okay. I can immediately write the solution. Now, here is the question. Do you think this corresponds to a maximum or minima? So, how can I check this? Well, this is my cost function. If this matrix, let me call this matrix M. So, actually, we have studied quite a lot on this kind of things. If this matrix M is positive definite, then this corresponds to a minima. Meaning that if this, well, very simple actually. If m is greater than zero, then positive definite, then this corresponds to a minima. If it's positive semi-definite, it's also a co corresponding to a minima, but there can be multiple solutions in that case. So how can I check that whether it's a transpose a? Is positive semi-definite or not? Okay. So let's check A transpose A is greater than zero positive semi-definite or not. So how can I do this? Let's apply the definition. Well, apply definition. So X transpose a transpose A X. So the question is, is it greater than or equal to zero for all X not equal to zero? That is the thing that I'm trying to find. But this is already this part is equal to. So I have an equality over here. So this is equal to A X norm square. Okay. Ax norm square. So clearly, Ax norm square is always non negative. And we know that Ax norm square or norm, so this by the you know, axioms of the norm, is equal to zero if and only if Ax is equal to zero. Isn't it? The argument of this should be equal to zero. And this corresponds to x is a non-trivial x has an x, let me say, sorry, a a 
has a non-trivial null space. So that means the following, because my various x is not equal to zero. I, I am always considering non-zero x vectors. So this is vector, this is vector, non-zero x vectors. So that's also equal to columns of A are not linearly independent. So in other words, if these columns of tall matrix are linearly dependent, maybe the first column is equal to the second column, okay? Then, of course, by combining the first column by 1 and second column by minus 1 and discarding all other columns, I can get a zero vector over here, okay? Then, columns of... This corresponds to a non-trivial null space. This corresponds to an x vector, 1 minus 1, all zero vector, making the right-hand side equal to zero. Of course, this is this. So what we see is that this is always satisfied. And if A matrix is you know, having independent columns, then this is positive, definite. So A is greater than or equal to zero. Um, in general, so, sorry, sorry, A transpose A is greater or equal to zero in general. <coughs> and if A transpose A, or if A has is full column rank, so as you see, there is so much terminology, but they all say the same thing. Full column rank, then A transpose A is also you know, not only semi-definite, but it's positive definite in this case. So all of these results, at the end, they say that, indeed, this made this problem, this, the minima of this, the, sorry, the extra um, extremum of this problem is, the minimum corresponds to a minimum of this cost function, okay? That is it. So we check whether this extremum is minima or maxima, this one, by checking positive definiteness of this quadratic term. Okay. Very good. So that's all I would like to say. What else? Now, this is the end of linear algebra review. And we are also starting a brief review of DSP topics. review of digital signal processing topics. Maybe I should say some DSP topics because it's not a very general review. So what is DSP? Well, digital signal processing. But before that, let me think about analog. Analog processing. You have X of T. This X of T is processed by H of T. Then you have Y of T. Okay, so what's the meaning of this H of T? I'm assuming that, so this is a convolution integral. So I have such an integral relation between output and the input. So what is input? Input is a time function. So what is this H of T? H of T is called impulse response. Okay, and Impulse response is calculated when the system or circuit, whatever it is, at initially at rest, so there is no energy in the system, so there is no initial conditions over here. Well, that is it. So that is for the analog processing. And whenever I have such a thing, H of t, I'm always considering a linear time invariant system. Okay, LTI system, linear time invariant system. So linearity is quite obvious from this this block diagram corresponds to this mathematical equation. If you have superposition of x because of this integral relation, you have summation of two integrals. So superposition principle, additivity is immediately satisfied. 
well, homogeneity is also satisfied by multiplying by x and so on, so linearity is obvious. Time invariance is, so if you apply the input at a different time, at a later time, the response is shifted. The response is only shifted by, you know, to the next application time, let's say. So we have LTI systems. So any LTI system can be represented like this one. So they are essentially equivalent. Okay, linear time invariance and impulse representation, they are equivalent. So this is actually classical signal processing, meaning that, for example, you may have a voltage source, you may have a resistance and a capacitance. So you define an output, V out of T. You define an input, let's say V in of T. Now there is a relation between input and the output, okay? So you have to calculate the impulse response and from that impulse response you can write something like this, V out of T again. So this is again H of T, V input, sorry this is tau, T minus tau, V tau. So as you see, of course, do you remember I have said, you know, zero initial energy. You assume that this capacitor does not contain any initial energy and so on. So that is details about the system theory. But in general, there is a mapping between input and the output at zero initial energy condition, satisfied by this, what we call this impulse response of the system. So this was, you know, for a very long time, until the invention of transistor and so on, this was the only processing mechanism. In other words, this voltage source, maybe this is not a voltage source, but this is your antenna. Maybe you have a, you know, a simple antenna like this. This antenna is connected to your TV and so on. Okay? So this antenna is receiving or there is some electromagnetic waves intercepted by this antenna. So you are receiving some voltage over here. So this waveform is, so this kind of a filtering. So it's filtered out. So after that filtering, you are maybe tuning a specific frequency. Of course, this is a low pass filter. If I make a, let's say, band pass filter and so on, it can be tuned to a specific frequency and then you will be, you know, watching some TV channel by this antenna and so on, classical. Still, this is being applied in RF because at very high frequencies, this is the only way to go. But what has happened? What has happened is the following. Again, you have an input, X of T, so you have continuous to discrete. So you have the sampler. Then what you have is some kind of a calculator. Then you have discrete to continuous conversion. And then you have this output Y of T. So from this input output viewpoint, continuous input, continuous output. But now I have at an intermediate step, you know this very well from earlier courses. So this X of N is nothing but the sampled version of this. So this Y of N is derived by discrete time, is by this calculator, let's say, and so on. So what's going on? So if I have a waveform, let's say X of T waveform over here, this waveform is sampled digital signal processing or discrete time right now, signal processing, by at every t second, okay? So I'm sampling the continuous waveform. So I get this, x of n. So as you see, n sample, first sample is, let's say this is zero sample, first sample is occurring at time t, second sample is when n is equal to two, it's at two t, and so on. So you have only samples. So you don't know what's happening in between. Okay. Then you have a calculator. This calculator is maybe something like this. Yn is equal to xn plus xn minus 1 divided by 2. Okay. Yn is calculating the average of last two samples. n sample and n minus first sample. So you can do this by a calculator or by an FPGA, you know, by a power PC, whatever you want. Okay. But you can exactly calculate these numbers. 
okay? because it's just like a calculation result, provided that you don't have overflows, etc. You, you may have some hardware problems, but if you can you know, uh, design a good system, then this system can calculate whatever result is exactly. So in analog systems, it may not be possible to do that. Because, you know, when you design a circuitry, these resistances are coming in fixed quantities, like you have 1K resistor, 2K resistor, and so on, but you don't have, for example, pi K resistor. So they are coming with some specific numbers. But over here, as you see, exact calculation is possible because I'm using a, essentially a digital calculator. Then what happens? So discrete time to continuous time conversion. Now this Y of N is converted to continuous time, okay? So that is a little bit interesting. So let's say that I have only these samples. So first sample, fourth sample, and so on. Let's say that the other samples are zero. Now the question is, this is y of n. These samples are y of n. Now how can I get y of t? So you can get y of t by maybe doing something like this. Well, if you can do for example, convolve this one, but there are some steps involved. But maybe the first step will be you write this in terms of direct deltas. Okay. So this is, let's say, 2, 3, 1. This is also 3. Now this is 2. This is 3, 1. Let's say. Of course, Dirac deltas, you know, they're of infinite uh, weight, so these heights does not mean anything, but I'm trying to sketch this in a waveform, okay? A little bit better. Now, if you convolve this by, let's say, you know, something like this, so this is t, 2t, 3t, 4t, etc. So, as you see, there is some, you know, discrete to continuous mapping also going on over here by direct, del direct deltas and so on. So if I convolve this by, let's say, a waveform like this, or let me have an easier waveform. So I think you will remember this. This is called zero order hold, okay? So what do you get? So this is such a case. It's always zero, and it's equal to one over here. For a duration, it's like a pulse of duration, t seconds. This pulse has unit amplitude. You may think about it like this. So what's the convolution result? So you get something like this. So these are, you know, dotted lines. So t, 2t, 3t, 4t, and at the end of 5t, I get 0. So this function is 0, it jumps to this level, jumps to this level, goes down to this level, and so on. So this level is 2, this is 3, this is one. So in other words, for every impulse, you know, apply the linearity. Linearity means apply this impulse to the system at time t. So if you apply the impulse, you get this impulse response. But this is applied at t each second. So you get the response by time invariance starting at t and goes like a t duration. So similarly for this one, for this one, for that one, you get the convolution result. Okay? That is it. So as you see that, this is nothing but, you know, if I call this x, let's say tilde t, or, so this was y. So this is y tilde t. 
convolved with you know h zero order hold of t okay this is our result so as you see that this is a continuous function okay so I get y of t maybe but this is like a stepwise defined function okay so it composed of some discrete steps as you see okay it's interesting now if I change to zero order hold to something else for example let me have another possibility so this is let's say linear interpolation So what's going on for this one? How can I convolve this one with this one? And what do I get at the end of this convolution result? Well, very easy. If you start with this, now you get a triangle over here. Okay, something like that. This is at T. Now you get, this is two. Okay, convolution of this with this, two times of this shifted to the, you know, teeth second. So if this is shifted to the teeth second, then because this is minus t, this is matching the origin, so this is two and so on. So how about this? At the next two t, three t, four t. 5t, I have some other triangles. So I'll be adding them up. So convolution exercise, okay? This is this. This is this is a level and that is I guess it one two three four impulses one two three four impulses over here so I should be adding up those four waveforms four triangles you may say okay so what do I have if I add them up I add well nothing to add over here just this straight line so I should in this interval I'm adding two lines so I get a straight line but it's this straight line is joining this with this now the other one is joining with that, joining with that, and you get this. So this becomes a linear interpolation. Okay. As you see. Okay. So this part, you may say, may be the interesting part. Because first sample is taking the value of 2, the next sample is taking the value of 3, in between, just in between, at the intermediate point, then it's taking the value of 2.5 according to this interpolation. You know, this is called linear interpolation. Okay. Zero order hold, you are assuming that this function is making a jump at the beginning of the sampling incident and it stays the same. This is this kind of an interpolation. But this is filling in the unknown samples linearly. In other words, if I am closer to the sampling point, now the average, so it's like an averaging operation. Now, if I'm closer to this sampling point, the average of these two is taken, but most of the weight is given to this one. Okay, so it's like a linear, you know, combination of two samples. Okay, that is it. So this is called linear interpolation. Now a question arises. I mean, this looks very arbitrary. I can have so many linear interpolators and so on. You know, these are just one of these two. But here is an interesting result. So if x of t is band limited, that is x of f is equal to zero. What is x of f? Fourier transform of x of t for f, let's say, greater than some bandwidth, okay? 
Okay, so this is called bandwidth. So what's the meaning of this? Now I have x of f. So I'm assuming that there is a waveform over here, but this waveform has, let me write bandwidth over 2. And this is bandwidth over 2. Okay, so I'm assuming that this x of f, it is the spectrum, okay? Maybe it's the magnitude spectrum, because it can be complex valued in general. But if this complex value is equal to zero, then the function is equal to zero, obviously. So I'm assuming that this is called the support of this function, support of x of f. So support of x of f is? limited to an interval, interval of length BW, which we call bandwidth, okay? Then, X of, let's say, N is equal to X of N over one over bandwidth. Okay. So I can call this also my T, sampling period. Okay. Or let me write this like T. Assuming T is smaller than 1 over bandwidth, okay? So that means that, now you have bandwidth, 1 over bandwidth is, it has a unit of seconds. If you are sampling, your sampling time is shorter than 1 over bandwidth, it's called the Nyquist rate, or 1 over t is greater than bandwidth, so this is called Sampling frequency right now. Sampling frequency is greater than, so what is, there are many bandwidth definitions, but this bandwidth is support. Support of X of F. So if sampling frequency, sometimes denoted by Fs, is greater than support of X of F under that condition, okay, so as you see, you have something like this. Then, we have x of t is equal to x of n. We have an interesting result. t over t minus n. So let me write this better. So what's going on? So as you see, I have an equality over here. Maybe I should explain this equality. But why, what I see is that these are just the samples. Just like these samples. Okay, I'm collecting these samples at t times instant, as before. But here is something interesting going on. Now I don't have a zero order hold or first order interpolator, as you see. This is called sync interpolator, sync interpolation. or this is called band-limited interpolation. So first of all, what is the sync function? Well, let me explain. That sync function is sync of x. This is our definition in electrical engineering. In physics, it's a little different. It is this. In physics, you don't have pi. That is the difference. But in electrical engineering, in our you know, terminology, sync is this. So how can I you know, sketch this function. Well, let me move this. Okay. Let me have, you know, axis over here. Sync function. I'm trying to draw this. So, well, you can say at zero, I have a problem because I have division by zero. But let's do not consider it for now. Okay. 
sourcing function it is approaching from left and right the value of 1. You can check it if you wish by L'Hopital's rule if you wish. This is x sync function approaches this and for every let's say integer value 1, 2, 3, 4 or minus 1, minus 2, minus 3 and so on. If you check this, if instead of x, if I put minus 1, minus 2, 1, 2, whatever, I get sine pi times an integer, I get 0. Okay? So that is what I see. So by the definition of the sync function, we are also taking the value of this function as its limits. Okay? So we are assuming that this sync function is equal to 1 when x is equal to 0 also. Okay? Because, you know, that's our, because this is not a singularity. x is equal to 0 is not a singularity of this function. This function is not blowing up at x is equal to 0. Because it has a 0, it has a, you know, there's a cancellation over here. Okay. So this is a type of the function. So this is a function of infinite extent. Now if I do the same thing, for example, if I have impulse over here, then I need to shift this sync function by t seconds and multiply this function by 2. Okay? Then next one, I need to shift this sync function by 2 t seconds and multiply this function by 3 and add with this one, just like we have done over here. Okay? This will be sync interpolation. Okay? But since this is sampled by t, maybe I should be a little bit careful. So let's try to well, understand that. Mm. Let me erase this part. Okay, so for example, now we have seen this meaning of the sync function. Now if I have x, let's say empty, what is the value of x empty? x of n sync mt divided by t minus n according to this. Okay. But these cancels. So m is an integer. So n is clearly as an integer. This is the sample index. Okay. So I have sync m minus n. So this is an integer. So sync integer values, as you see, it's always equal to zero. But only case it is non-zero is delta n minus m, this is. Because when m is equal to n, when this is equal to zero, I have one. So as you see that sync n minus n is equal to this delta. This is the time chronicle delta. This is direct delta. This is chronicle delta. This is like an if statement. It is equal to 1 when m is equal to n. It's like an if statement. This direct delta is much more complicated. This is a limiting operation. So it's, you know, this is the reason that we have brackets like this. So the area under this function is equal to 3 and so on. So the area or weight of this direct delta is given like this. Okay? So don't confuse these symbols. Uh, symbols. So this has square brackets. This is called Kronecker delta. And the other one is Dirac Delta. Very different. Okay. So what's going on? It says that if I add up this, only the case when m is equal to n. I have 1 over here. So m is, let's say, 1 million. When n is equal to 1 million, then this is equal to 1. For all others, it's equal to 0. So you see that I get x of m. So indeed, what we see is that, well, uh, this is an interpolation function. So if I do this calculation, the value of this left-hand side, t function, at this time is equal to the sampling value, the sampling value. So indeed it's an interpolation function. Well, that says something about it. So how does it interpolate? As we have said before, let me have only two samples. If I have t, two, if I have 3. Now, it is in inserting this interpolating function for this 
Let me move over here, this one. Okay, so convolution of on this with this, okay? It is, again, inserting this interpolating sync function. Okay. This T is not very important for us for now. So don't worry about this. So it's just shifting this, you know, this X of N is scaling the sync function. And you have shifted sync functions, as you see. And you are just adding them up. The important thing is that As you see, this sync function, so this is at 3t, this is at 4t. Since this sync function is passing through zeros at every sampling time instant, so for example, over here, if I evaluate the sum, blue curve plus the black curve, at this instant, if I evaluate, so I'm adding up this value plus a zero, okay? So also at this instant, at 2t instant, I get this black value plus you know, a zero because blue curve is passing through at the other sampling instant, it's passing through zero. So this is the reason I have this. Okay, one, two integer points and so on. So this is the reason that actually it's interpolating polynomial. Now, you can say, okay, this is interesting, but how you can prove this? Well, this proof is, this is basically the sampling theorem, okay? This is famous Nyquist sampling theorem. This is the basic of basis of dig digital signal processing. Okay, sampling theorem. Now, given this, what else? So I won't be proving this, but. It's not very difficult to prove such results, you know, by, you know, in, especially in frequency domain, it's rather easy to prove such results. But this is very critical for us. Why it is critical? Remember, I had such a diagram. Now, in this diagram, this was y of n. Okay. Now, assume that, assume x of t is band limited. That is, x of n is the samples collected above uh, Nyquist rate. Not that is, but and, and Nyquist rate. So assume that this is like a band-limited signal. So in practice, most of these, almost all of these waveforms are band-limited. We don't have infinite band signals. So this is a very practical thing. Even if it is, you know, exactly band-limited, for practical purposes, you may assume that it is band-limited and it's good enough in many cases. Now, if you have x of t band-limited, meaning that I can go back and forth by Nyquist sampling theorem. So if I have all the samples, I can generate x of t if I can, you know, sample this fast enough, meaning that t sampling time is small enough or sampling frequency is large enough, okay? Then if I can sample, there's no loss over here. If there is no loss, now I get this without any loss. I can always go back right now. Now with a calculator, I can get yn exactly. Now from this yn, I will apply the same sampling formula and then I can get this y of t. Okay, so this is very interesting right now because earlier, when I have a circuit example like this, let's say that 
maybe let me have, you know, maybe a more reasonable I input T. Let me have an RLC, like a tuner circuitry. R C L. Now, in practice, again, you have an antenna, you tune your L and C components and so on, such that you want to receive maybe a radio metro and so on. So what do you do? You generate a circuitry, maybe not this simple, but it has you know center frequency or you know it has a passband. So this passband is uh, it, it, its passband is characterized. Then what do you do? You implement the circuitry. But as time goes, for example, you have some problems with the inductors. Inductor is aging out, so inductance value is changing. Now you have to always calibrate the circuit. Or you may have a short circuit or you have to replace this resistance. Okay. Capacitance, electrolytic capacitors, they are giving you some headaches, okay? Because of, of aging and so on. Now what do you do? Now you have to always take care of your circuit. You cannot set these quantities exactly as you want because you know, this inductance can be very big, you don't want very big inductance and so on. So you have all kinds of practical problems. But if, to, if the input is band limited, then this calculator can, you know, there is something called impulse invariance. So the issue is this, if you have H of T, impulse response of this system, H of T, a, well, it's obvious, impulse response. Now, if you can have H of N in continuous time, let's say, T times H continuous T, okay, impulse invariance, then instead of this calculator, now I will be writing more signal processing terminology. Now I'm writing a discrete time system, H of N. Now I'm getting Y of N by discrete time processing. Okay? So this is like discrete time convolution right now. Now I get the samples of this. So these samples, what's your guess? Again, our you know critical formula, sampling theorem. Now the issue is the following. If x of t is band limited in this operation, so this input, it is corresponds to our x of t. Maybe this voltage is our y of t, output, input, output. Now what do you think? If x of t is band limited, clearly y of t is also band limited because of the Fourier transform. Because x of t times h, sorry, x of f, let me write, y of f in Fourier domain is equal to h of f times x of f. So if this has finite support, clearly this also has finite support. Okay? Now you can say that I can also consider a band limited version of this. Okay? So if this is band limited to minus b over 2 to b over 2 and 0 everywhere else, Let's assume that this one is not zero, but you know whatever, I will be multiplying these two. So I only need to take care of, because of this multiplication, for this h of f, so this is h of f, the second one, this is x of f, input spectra. So I need to take care of only this part actually, because after this multiplication, all of these parts will be equal to zero. So I may consider that this continuous time system is also band limited to this band because I know that the output will be band limited when this is input is exactly band limited. Okay, very interesting. Now output will be the product of this red curve and this blue part and zero everywhere else. So what's going on? So if I assume this h of t is band limited to this part h continuous t, take its samples, take its samples by sampling period t, which is compatible with this, about Nyquist rate, okay, then I get the samples of this. 
So this becomes, you know, some samples over here. If I do this discrete time convolution, discrete time processing, I get Y. Okay. So from this Y, this corresponds to the samples of a band limited signal. Samples of a band limited signal. Okay. Because, you know, because of this discussion essentially. Now, if I interpolate, inter, interpolate by the sampling theorem, I get y of t. And what is interesting is that this result, you know, by this digital processing, is exactly equal to this analog result. You apply band limited signal, measure this. It is exactly equal. So what is interesting is that even though you cannot implement this very accurately because of these practical considerations, Assume that you have a filter, a mathematically defined filter, whose response you can calculate on the paper. Okay? By doing this and generating this calculator with the samples of this uh, filter impulse response calculating on the paper, you can exactly implement the system that you have designed or that you have in your mind. This is something great because there is no loss. The system is perfectly uh, realized. Okay. This is a very big problem in circuit theory. Realization. How do you realize a transfer function and so on. So what we see is that for band limited inputs, this realization is exact, provided that I am sampling about Nyquist rate and so on. So this has changed actually quite a lot of things. So it has changed the way we think about you know, signal processing. Now once you are capable of generating these samples, let's say fast enough, above Nyquist rate. Once you have the means of generating uh, this digital to continuous you know, waveforms, and in practice, sorry, this is called DAC, digital to analog converter. So you can buy chips for this. So this is a big, you know, design, um, some big uh, circuit design houses are designing some digital to analog converters. And this is called, there are some other details, but roughly, analog to digital converter. This is ADC. Okay. So there are some chips also for this. So right now, if you have an input X of T, if it is band limited, you immediately sample it. Sample it. If it is not band limited, you just have a low pass filter. You band limit your X of T and then sample it. Then process with your calculator in any way that you like. Then you have samples. Then these samples are converted to the output as a continuous waveform by digital to analog converters. So today's ADCs are very fast. Okay? So it's even possible to do this. Now you have an antenna, maybe not this kind of an antenna. There's an electromagnetic wave. You have a very rough filter. So this is just a filter. So this is a, of course, low pass filter. Let me write. But it's not a very you know, good filter. It's a very cheap filter. Maybe you don't even need this filter in some cases. So you immediately take ADC and you have H of N, well, let's write DSP, digital signal processing, and from this digital signal processing, you have DAC, then you have output. Okay. So, in many cases, you don't have this even low pass filter. You immediately sample it. After sampling it, you calculate by, you know, you have FPGs or some, let's say, uh, what is it? You may have a maybe a microprocessor, a simple microprocessor, uh, some Arduino processor, whatever it is, after sampling, doing some operations over it. Then it's converting to uh, continuous waveforms, and you got your output. Okay. So this is output. So what we see is that there is no analog processing going on, except this one. Okay. Well, this is all related with, you know, this ADC speed, you know, its sampling rate your processor's capability of doing operations, you know, how fast your processor can catch up with incoming data, okay? Then that is it. So, now, what else I should say? So this is the general thing about digital signal processing, the most important thing. 
Let me say a few other things about Fourier transforms and so on. Again, this is just a reminder. Maybe this is important for DSP professionals because this is the basic of our, you know, very basics of our field. Okay. And I recommend you to examine some practice of, for example, how do you, you know, what is the circuitry behind this analog to digital converter? Because if you are a DSP engineer, let's say, now you know how this thing, you know, this mapping, discrete time convolution very well. Just spend some time over here and over there also. Just be familiar with that technology. Because those two ends are, this is our interface to the reality, okay? So the other part is somewhat like abstract operations. And this kind of operation in Oppenheim's textbook in EE430, this is called discrete time processing. My explanation, discrete time processing of analog signals. So there is a chapter. So all of these things that I have said is called discrete time processing of analog signals. Okay, I think it's clear. It's categorized under that you know section. Now I would like to say a few things about Fourier transforms. And basically that will be it for today. Now I want to you know just give you this terminology or the notation. Okay. So this is you know, let me write, if I have x of t, then this is capital X of f. So we are store this Fourier transform relation. So this is Fourier mapping. Okay. F. I want to write here f's. Okay. So what's going on? So in uh, different textbooks, you have different notations, but this is the simplest notation. And this is the notation used in many communication textbooks and also, because it's the simplest, I'll be also using this. So f is in frequency. So f is in hertz, you may say. Okay. f is the frequency. And in, for example, Oppenheim's textbook, this is written as omega, capital omega. And if you write a capital omega over here, you have a 1 over 2 pi factor at the inverse Fourier transform. So this is the inverse Fourier transform. And this one is the forward or forward, well, just Fourier transform. Okay, that is it. So in this notation, everything is symmetric as you see. Okay, that is it. So what else? Just as an exercise, so let me calculate the Fourier transform of, for example, a rectangle waveform. Okay, just as an exercise, how you do this. So what is this rectangle waveform? So for our purposes, 1 over 2t minus 1 over 2t. And this is one of, this is what T. This is my rectangle waveform, rectangle T over T. There are several definitions, but let's assume for now that this rect corresponds to this. So this is a function taking zero values outside of this interval. It takes the value of T and it goes again to zero. After a one over t second, okay. Or, sorry, this is oh, sorry, sorry. So this is t over two. This is t over two. Let me call this one over t. So this is a rectangle of duration t seconds. So this is as you see over here. I have t seconds in seconds. Let's say. Okay. 
So the question is, what is the Fourier transform of this Fourier transform? So how do I do this? Well, let me call this x of t. Then x of f is equal to x of t's Fourier transform. x of t is this. So it's equal to 1 over t in between minus t over 2 to t over 2. Okay. Then it's 0 elsewhere, so I'm not even integrating that part. Then I have to multiply by this exponential. And I integrate it. Okay? That is it. So how do you do such integrals? Because I have done several integrals like that. Now I'm more experienced because this integral comes up all the time. So this is cosine 2 pi ft plus minus, sorry, minus j sine 2 pi ft. Am I right? That part is this. Now, this is an integral which is, has a symmetric you know, starting point and an ending point. So this is an odd function, sine. So if you integrate an odd function over a symmetric period, what do I mean? Sine is something like this. Now, if you select symmetric periods, for example, you select this, and this is also symmetric. So if this is a, this is minus a, the, these two areas cancel, so you get a zero. Odd function integrated between minus a and a, because of the symmetry, is equal to zero. Areas cancel. So let me erase that. So my comment is this. I don't need to calculate this part, because if I calculate the integral, this is odd symmetric. This is an odd function it will be equal to zero. So I need to calculate on the cosine, cosine 2 pi ft. Okay? Now, then I can also do this. This is 2 times 0 t over 2. So 1 half is integrated. Let me move this t also over here. Cosine 2 pi ft dt. Okay? So what's going on? This time, this is even symmetric. This is an even function. So if I calculate this even function from 0 to t over 2, or minus t over 2 to 0, I get the same value, because this is right now an even function. So this is the reason I have 2, and this is the reason that I'm only calculating the half of this integral. Now, I think it's clear, 2 over t cosine. I'm integrating it. Sine 2 pi ft. So I'm in integrating with respect to t, 2 pi f. So if I take the derivative of this, let me see, cosine 2 pi f t. Okay, I think we are done. So this is t is equal to 0, and t is equal to capital T over 2. Okay, so let me write it over here. Then this is equal to 2 over t. When t is equal to this, sine pi, t is equal to capital Ft, this is equal to, these twos cancel, don't, let's do not write this, 1 over t, then I have pi f also, let me then write, this is equal to this, okay? So indeed, what we see is this, this is sinc ft. Remember our sinc definition. Where was it? Sinc definition is sinc, sorry. Sinc of x, this is our definition. Sine pi x over pi x. Okay? So sinc argument, pi times argument, pi times argument. So this is sinc of ft. Okay? So what do I have? So what I see is, well, sorry, this is, I'm out of space, but let me briefly sketch this over here. So this is a sinc function. It is, we have studied this. It's taking, you know, zeros when the argument is an integer. 
So how can be this argument be an integer? So what is the independent variable? Independent variable is f, spectrum. Okay, so this is x of f. So this is real, so I don't even need this, you know, magnitude sign or so, because, you know, it's an even function. Even function has an even Fourier transform, okay? So I know that this sync function takes the value of 1, by definition. Or uh, when argument is equal to 0, it is the value 1. So when the argument is an integer, this is an integer. So how can this be an integer? When f is equal to 1 over t. So this is 1 over t. This is 2 over t. This is minus 1 over t. This is the zeros of the sync function. Okay, 2 over t. So I get something like that. Okay, that is the end. Okay, so we see how sync comes up. Sync function comes up in these calculations. So when you have a, let's say, an ideal low pass filter, um, not a low pass filter, but when you have a rectangle in a domain, a rectangle function in a domain, you have in the other domain a sync waveform. Okay, so you may say if in the spectrum I have a you know, something like this, this is in spectrum, let's say F, then this becomes a low pass filter, then this low pass filter in time domain corresponds to a sync impulse response. This is time domain representation. So in signal processing, once you learn these domains, actually which one is time, which one is frequency is not important. There is just a mapping between this one and that one. Sometimes I call this x, sometimes I call this kx. x means, you know, it's a uh, function of meters or function of space parameters. Then kx becomes spatial frequency, okay? x is time, then this becomes 1 over time, okay? It is hertz. If x is meters, this is like 1 over meters. So if you have a periodic waveform in time, you may have a periodic waveform in, let's say, space also. Then this will be spatial frequencies. How many oscillations it's making in a meter, let's say. Okay? You can define something like that. But once you have used to you know, these definitions, you can extend them to other domains. Okay, that's all I would like to say. Okay, thank you. About uh, digital signal processing, its connection with analog signal processing, and so on. So we will continue next time with more discussions. Thank you.